Gig Gab, episode 415 for Monday, February 5th, International Clash Day 2024. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Our sponsor today is Banzoogle.com, where you can use the promo code GIGGABEPK to get 10% off the first year of their new EPK plan subscription. We'll tell you more about that in a little bit. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton, and today uh, we're bringing back uh, our, a friend of the show, and uh, we'll we'll talk all about the stuff you do, but but you know front of house for uh, Florence and the Machine in the past, Queensrÿche, Rush, I think Bruce Hornsby. The list goes on and on. Brad Maddox, thank you so much for coming back on the show. I'm very happy to be here again, Dave. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I it it is International Clash Day. They're like one of the few bands that has their own international day, but it's also National Shower with a Friend Day. If you if you want to go that route. <laughs> I think I'm that's that is long behind me. <laughs> you guys you guys have fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh so Brad the the it, it the, this is your second time on the show with us here. The the first time was in a- April or maybe May of 2020 right after we all kind of knew that things were not happening in the live music world for a little bit and yeah. uh and we had a nice conversation about what you had done and what you might hope to do <laughs> again someday. And then we had a, a year or more of how long, I guess that's a great place to start. Like how you, you know, you're it, at least up and up until that point, you were at a level in your career where you were doing sound for a list touring acts. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is, it, did you, did you, when did you wind up, working in the live arena again after that like what was your first tour did you start doing s- smaller gigs or did you wait until there was a big national tour to to go do well the the, the funny thing is that um I, I had been slated to do uh the motley crew tour that was supposed to go out that year yep and um they said oh we're gonna have to push it back till uh july and then oh we're gonna push it back to the fall and then it just sort of went away altogether. Of course. Yeah. And um, the next thing that came up was early 2022, and it was Florence Machine. So that basically filled up my my break was COVID. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Florence and the Machine tour took two years off or whatever, and then back on Florence and the Machine. Got so it. Um, uh, I want to say it was... Uh, February 2022 was the first uh, gig I did, maybe March. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you really, you did take all of that COVID lockdown <laughs> off. Uh, more or less. I more mean, or I less. Yeah. Try to keep myself busy, but yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And, and it, it, I, so I have a lot of questions. Um, it, <laughs> what, what did you do in the interim to keep yourself busy? You mentioned the last time you were on, you have Diablo Digital, which is a company yeah. that you created uh, with a partner who, it will tell us what, what does Diablo Digital do? So uh, uh, my partner is Greg Price, who's not currently Metallica's front of house engineer, and he had done Ozzy. And I, I've known him since the '80s. We started a recording business, a multi-track touring recording business, about 12 years ago. Sort of formalized it about 10 years ago, and uh, grew from four systems uh, that we'd built together up to I don't even know 60 or so. Wow. Um, and we've had them out on a lot of different things, Rolling Stones, U2, our own tours. Yep. Um, and, uh, uh, that is pretty much a matured business at this point. Um, so during the pandemic, I really kind of refocused on that. I mean, there was a lot of things like we'll try streaming, we'll try, um, you know, podcasting, try this, try that. But what it really wound up happening was I. Uh, I got focused on upgrading some of the older touring systems, you know, cleaning things up, um, you know, uh, upgrading 
OSs and uh, sure. versions of, of of the DAWs. All the things that you can't, yeah. that you don't when you're do busy, right, right. when you're exactly. busy, right? Yeah. All right. So take everything, take it apart, blow it out, I'll reinstall the OS or install the new OS. So anyway, uh, that kept me getting into the office a few times a week anyway for or uh, whatever wound up being 16 months or so. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Right. right. Huh. And yeah. it, uh, those, th- those recording uh, rigs that either you use or you, I assume loan out to other tours that are using them, yeah. they, they're taking those and, and then using them to, to record and then release their own albums or live albums or streams or whatever yeah. it is they want to do. So they're use they're useful in a number of ways. That's one, um, and that has happened on a few occasions. Uh, well, like the Rolling Stones will use it, and every once in a while, put out a little nugget, you know, one yeah. song, uh, well, along with video on their on their website. Um, uh, for example, and I know uh, I recorded Sarah Bareilles with one of them, and when that turned into a record uh, live at Hollywood Bowl. Uh, we recorded um, Florence the Machine at uh, Madison Square Garden. It, well, maybe anyway, but at a show somewhere. somewhere. I think, Madison Square Garden, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that turned into a, a record. Uh, so yeah, also it's just really useful for engineers to have to to play back and um, know that you know they're, they're check their work, but also do something called virtual sound check where we're where they can play the actual band through the PA during the day. And it's, uh, you know, a pretty good replication of what the band is going to sound like later. So that's super useful. A lot of engineers just use it for that. Oh yeah. Um, uh, we're sort of starting to embark on maybe more tighter integration with video, um, for post-production. It's something we've been trying to do for a long time, but, uh, we're just getting to that point where that's, um, more viable from a technological standpoint. Yep. So it's always been like we, we got on a tour and the tour is carrying 90% of what they need to do to make a movie. Yeah. And, um, I think Taylor Swift opened a lot of eyes this year with that movie. She, that made a lot of money. Um, and suddenly people are far more interested in the technology because, uh, you do have a lot of what you would need to, to do that, you know, currently on the tour. Absolutely. We had a, uh, a friend of mine, Davis Thurston, who is a sound engineer locally here. I've worked with him a bunch and he (coughs) sort of is similar to, to you, you know, during the pandemic, he took some time and he'd always had this vision of doing a multicam live stream and, and, or Mm -hmm. recording of, you know, local bands. And he, Mm -hmm. I'll put a link in the, in the show notes for anybody that wants to listen, if you didn't, but, Davis went nuts and he figured out like, you know, the, he could, he can do eight GoPros and he figured out if he's using mm-hmm. an Atom switcher, you know, this port can take a 30 foot HDMI cable. This port can only take a six foot one, but he figured it out and he can live yeah, record awesome. and, and mix it because it doesn't take that much more to your point. I, you know, even a local band has a lot of what you need <laughs> to make yeah. a movie these days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and there's like people playing around with other technologies, like um, uh, setting up uh, iPhones on stands around the stage, yeah, and and, and streaming the vi- the video content to a central location and doing like uh, you know either ingesting the video or and I mean you know it's 4K video. It, it, yeah, it's not bad. It's um, not bad. No. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so we're. We're poking around at that. Um, Still the big hurdle from a live standpoint is, you know, being able to upload or stream these things from a remote venue, which may or may not have the greatest internet. Uh, But we're starting to see, you know, more and more places where it's viable. Okay. um, I mean, you don't need that much, right? I mean, if you're doing the, the even a 4K mix, if you're doing the the mix locally, right? So you're only sending right. one 4K stream away. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, what do you need? Mm-hmm. 50 megabits per second? I mean, it has to be consistent and clean. Don't get me wrong. I understand. Yeah, but, it's got to be like really tight. You yeah. know, um, you're not going to do it on Wi-Fi. You can't and, use Wi-Fi. Right. Fair. Yeah. yeah fair. Uh, so, 
um, you probably want to lease a line if you're if it's really kind of important that you send it somewhere yeah. like or if use paid, satellite. If people have paid for this, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So um, I don't know. I, I think we're looking at something maybe a little bit more involved in that, like sending multi, like, like pushing multi-track to a remote. Got it. Site for like um. Anyways, there's a lot of ideas that require high bandwidth but really more importantly bandwidth that cannot go away like it's got to be a line solid. that's totally solid and nobody else has got traffic it's like a dark fiber line that nobody else is using yep. uh that kind of thing so are venues anyways. putting these in because they know that this is going to happen i mean ta- <laughs> well, if you pay for it <laughs> if you oh okay all right well i mean i know that like I, i'm a i'm a fan of the band fish right and they've been doing live streams since of, of, you know, what 90% of their shows or something for, for years, not maybe not quite a decade, but, but close. And yeah, a straight up, a straight up live stream from the site is definitely doable. Okay. And, uh, most, most facilities, most arenas will have a- enough, enough bandwidth on site that as long as you can block it out for what you're doing. And my impression is as long as you, pay for it you can do that got it okay <laughs> uh, yeah. uh we're looking at more like you know we need to get on fiber to a remote location and um you know like we might be looking at doing stuff in a movie theater for example like that kind of thing so uh um, right. it's a little more involved than simply streaming i mean so i'm not saying it's so simple to stream like five years ago, it was impossible, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kinda, Now it's like, that's not that big. Now we take it for granted. If it doesn't work, we, we're totally. pissed, right? Yeah, exactly. No, totally, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like if you can't do it from the airplane, you're disappointed. You're just, dis- yeah. Why can't I stream <laughs> Netflix from the plane? Yeah. This is crazy, you know? Yeah, yeah. I want my 4K yeah. on my Apple Vision Pro, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So, uh, so that's the, sort of what's on the horizon right now. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, just simply multi-track recording a show has become kind of mundane. Like people do it all the time. Yeah, you do it on a laptop in most cases. No yeah, big deal. Yeah, and and mm-hmm. it, I mean your your Diablo rigs that that you're providing to people are they are they recording to a laptop or is it is it more involved than that or? Um, it's more involved than that. We're we're our systems tend to be uh, sync involved, so you can sync the video. Got it. Uh, which probably will be doable on a laptop in five years. Um, it's just not really right now. Not, Got it. not in a very, not in a very precise way. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you figured out the precise way of doing this so that it's yeah. essentially turnkey for a tour that wants to go and, and do this kind That's of thing. That's the idea. That's yep. the idea. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That, that's, that's, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. It's a handful. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, but that's, that's where business opportunity comes from, right? Like you right. take on the handful, you figure it out, you deliver this turnkey thing and people say, thank yeah. you, you know, and, and hopefully write right. you a check. Yeah. Cause it's a giant pain to do. We do it. So you don't have to. <laughs> we do it. So you don't have to, right? No, that, yeah. that totally makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Anyway. Yeah, go ahead. Did you have something? No, else no, nothing. It's, it's wrapping up. That's good. Oh no. Yeah. It's good. Um, so you've been back out on the road, uh, and w- since the COVID lockdowns, it, it, what is it? How what is different about normal now in your world? Uh, I, I mean, I'm I, I, I assume, but there's no reason to assume that. Like, it, it seems like at least in gigs at my level, which is much lower, uh, that you know the, the concerns about testing and all that have just like evaporated, and no one's thinking about that. But there there have been some changes in terms of clubs wanting to have you know gu- guarantees or are kind of out the, the window and that mm. sort of thing the last time you were on you sort of uh, uh posited that guarantees might go away at the top end of the industry too because mm. insurance companies uh, found out they had to pay out when there's a pandemic yeah. you know so yeah. and, like what's different about your world if anything these days yeah so um, the testing thing kind of ended for us also a year, a year or so ago. Okay, I mean, that's, about the same time, it, yeah. Right, so people are really doing it um, on a regular basis. Uh, of 
funny story. I, so I went to, I started the show with Florence and Machine in rehearsals in London. We rehearsed together for uh, several weeks, so five or six weeks. We tested every day before we had to come in. Uh, once the band rehearsals were over, we loaded out, we moved up to the first show which is an underplay which means we're playing a small club right yep uh and um it just sort of generates some buzz uh went and loaded in rehearsed there for a couple days i woke up the day of the first show took a test and tested positive oh and of course they're like well you can't come in (laughs) first show show one um and we had built in like some redundancies and i think that's something we we still do now okay uh as as it happened also two of the members of the band got it and we had recorded uh stems of their of whatever they whatever they played we put it on a a, a left right yep stemmed it out and we had taken those uh stems and cut them i like I went to the venue long enough to like grab a hard drive, went back to the hotel, cut the stems, send them to the playback guy. And um, for the first handful of shows, four or five, uh, it was various versions of the playback being a stem of somebody in the band. Yeah. Because they couldn't come to the venue. Um, So we kept doing that for the whole tour. Uh, it was like if there was ever anything to happen to a band member, you know, from getting sick to being let go or whatever. Yep. We we had in the box a recording of everything they played that we could put onto. But it did wind up getting used one at least one more time in my memory, where um, one of the members of the band left their passport in their wardrobe case and couldn't and couldn't leave the country. We were in. <laughs> <laughs> so. We had, um, I had this, the recording of, of what they played and we did a combination of someone filling in for them, but then like the songs that that person couldn't quite get around. It's like the day before. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It's tough to sub. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So whatever. Right. And also, by the way, we're playing like 20,000 people. So it's not like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. The stakes are higher. Yeah. Right. So it's gotta be kind of right. Um, (laughs) they, uh, (laughs) they used the record, they used, he played, uh, quite a bit of it and then they used the recording for a handful of songs that you just really didn't have time to learn yeah yeah so i mean that's one that's one thing that we do and i will do from now on is track stems of what everybody plays just because you never know it's really smart um we we have a, a guy who's been on the show a couple of times this guy mike schulte plays in a a fairly sizable cover band out in the midwest mm-hmm. called the pork tornadoes mm-hmm. and uh I mean, they, 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 it's a great name. It's a great, it's a fantastic <laughs> name. Uh, they, uh, I mean, they'll play, you know, five to 10,000 seat venues. Like they're, you know, they do right. flyaways right. And, and this sort of thing. And nice. he said they're, they're going into the studio to, to record exactly this so that they've mm-hmm. got sort of replacements for every member. If, if, if you know, last mm-hmm. minute something mm-hmm. doesn't mm-hmm. happen. Yeah. Makes mm-hmm. sense. I saw, yeah. I saw a Keith Urban show at South by Southwest. I don't know. Mm-hmm half a dozen years ago or something and uh the bass player there was no bass player on stage and i Mm -hmm. i tweeted about it i'm like what's going on and uh it turns Mm -hmm. out the guy that like was you know having surgery for something and a bunch of the fans knew and they're like oh yeah they you know he was their md and i guess still is he's back with Mm -hmm. them but Mm -hmm. uh but you know, they just were like, "Oh yeah, we record every show, so that you know, that's what." They yeah, do. there you go. There's the bass. Here you go. There's play the bass. Yeah. yeah, we just play to that. Everything's to a click anyway, so it's fine. Yeah, and yeah. I guess I I suppose the Florence tour is to a click. Otherwise, you couldn't get away with playing the stems um, yeah, live. All, almost all of it. There's a lot of time code that yep. goes on, so you have to have a click. The time code is uh, firing video, firing lighting, uh, firing snapshots and audio. So um, there were out of, I don't know, the 20 something songs we played, there were probably six that were free that were not on any kind of click. Um, The rest of it, varying levels of playback, um, you know, from like full orchestral sort of things to uh, 
you know, to very, just whatever, like little sort of little beds here and there. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot, there was a lot of stuff on the last record that, um, Jack Adenoff produced that there were like these little weird sounds, like, uh, sort of strange horn parts just sort of coming in and out. And, uh, for example, and um, it was just not going to be like we're carrying a horn section. So right. for that, we, we you know we just used the we used the stems from the the record. And a lot of the other thing that happened was we had a lot of uh, different personnel changes, and the click the click requirements from different people really kind of changed. So we didn't have like one click; we had like four. Really? So there was like one for one person in the band, and one for the singer. You know. Um, one, not, so, we're not just talking different like levels of the click in their mix, but but different click different, patterns. No, different actual. R- yes. Yeah. So, for example, Florence just wants the beginning of the song and then wants oh. it to go away, right? And then she just wants to sing with the band. And so, unless there's a cue where she has to come back in after silence, whatever, uh, yeah. thirty minute, thirty seconds of free play. Uh, but in the meantime, the drummer needs to click like all the time, right? Uh, uh, and then like different members of the band might want it, uh, you know, they need to know when, um, I don't know. I, mean, I wasn't the person running it. So okay, <laughs> yeah, I was going to They, gonna, I was they gonna might want to know. There might be a certain cue that they need to yeah. uh, lock in, you know, with. to account, account in for a thing that they're supposed to play or do or whatever. So, uh, yeah, there were three or four different clicks and time code. So we had... 20 i don't know say 20 channels ish yeah uh and um so four of those were the two band members that were missing at the beginning of the tour <laughs> so uh, you know right. so right off the bat we have this sort of just in just in case sets uh and then there was time code and a handful of clicks i mean wow. the last third of what we were using had nothing to do with audio at all really right right yeah right yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, the, the 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 audience would never hear it. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. So, I I this reminds me of a thing. There was a a, a series of I wouldn't call it a movie, but it it was a series of um sort of glimpses into various different angles of one of the rush tours that you did, and and you were in the front of house part of it, explaining things yeah. and uh yeah. it, 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 it was beyond. Beyond the backstage, or something beyond the like lighted that. stage, uh, maybe. But uh, no, no, I don't think that was it. No, that was too direct of a cop. I remember it. It was kind of a series. Yeah, it was. They were like of, six of them, and they were twenty minutes yeah. long each, or something. Yeah. It the one where they were working with the guy who was running monitors. He yeah. he talked about how he was actively mixing the monitors for them live, like, like knowing, like, I'm going to bring up a guitar here at the beginning of this song. I'm going to bring it back mm-hmm. down, you, you know, what, whatever it, it, and it sounds like that kind of thing could also have happened with the, you know, I need to click here or there, but instead now it's, it's just all coded out and there's, it's not left up to, to interpretation by a human. Is that right? Or at least on this. Tour. Um, well, I think so. Rush did not play to a click, so there was not any, right. Right, time code running, but Brent Brent Carpenter was the engineer's name. On okay, that. Yeah. thank you. Yeah, he he uh, wrote God knows how many scenes on the desk to you know bump levels up and down for people when uh, they might need a little more of Something. a certain instrument to play along to whatever. Right? Sure, and yeah. um, the uh, um, time code on the in the shows it use it sort of gives you the opportunity to not you, you can don't have to be focused on stepping to the next you, scene you, the the, it'll it'll it, step you to know, the next scene for it you takes, it takes care of business for you and then you're just really focused on the handful of elements of vocal yeah uh, you know maybe there's a you know so like i'll program a i'll program a scene where the guitar gets turned up for solo for example but i also have a vca in front of me and if it's just too much or not enough i can sort of ride it up or down a little bit Got it. Uh, so it's not rigid, but it's taking care of the meat and the potatoes for you. Uh, I think Lincoln Park was a really good example of this. So we just, we time coded that show, and there was a lot going on as far as little bumps up and down and level. But I could program that stuff. Interesting. So okay, so I you're could, you're programming scenes for the show, and then stepping through those scenes, or letting the time code step you through if, code, if that's yeah, there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> and in the scenes also, like I would write a little uh, note on the, on the console uh, GUI that would sort of tell me when the next scene was supposed to happen, just in case I lost time code or, or yeah. something. I mean, the truth is that you sort of wind up memorizing it. Um, but uh, there, with like Lincoln Park, I said, like was a good example of the lots of little nuanced changes in level uh, that time code took care of for me. And I could just really pay attention to the two singers up there. Yeah, writing writing vocals up and down, so uh, I wasn't like relying on compression or whatever to to do to that take care of that for you. Me. Yeah, to do it for. I mean, we used it, of course. Yeah, of course. Uh, still, yeah. Still, it was like a very much focused on the stage and those two people singing, and rapping, and and being in the moment with with them and and being able to ride through the changes as they as they came along. That's really interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I'm, I do a lot of theater work. And so the, the idea of using scenes in that is, I mean, I can't, mm-hmm. I've seen people try, no pun intended, try to mix a, sh- a, a theater show by hand, like riding mutes, but yeah. it, it's a disaster. It, like it, at best. I don't, yeah. it, I don't know how you do it. I don't know. How, yeah, I, I mean, it's poorly is usually the, the answer to that question. I mean, it, you know, I would. I would be on stage and realize, oh, there's like four vocal mics that aren't yet unmuted or or there's four vocal mics that are unmuted, but they're off stage talking to each other like this is terrible. So I'm used to the scenes for that using scenes for that or having scenes used for that. Never thought about them for, a, a you know, a, a rock show or, a mu- you know, a, a live band. But I mean, it's theater like, it, like it's yeah. a show. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. Why? Why not <laughs> use it? Yeah. So the Florence show probably had 400 scenes of, about, depending on what we were doing. Wow. Some songs were one. Some songs were one. Sure. You know, I mean, there were songs that were just like, okay, you're just turning it on and, and off you go. But some shows were 25 or 30. A lot of it's muting, muting and unmuting background vocals, for example. Okay. Uh, um, like acoustic guitar and somebody had, Walks out with an acoustic guitar, hands it, it plugs it in. You want it muted, yeah, when right. that's going on. But then you want it unmuted when the verse one starts. That, that kind of stuff. Yep. Uh, so um, it's a. It just means I don't have to think about that. I can just she's talking. I can make sure that I've got. Also, like uh, muting and unmuting vocal effects. You know, so the song ends. I want oh, the yeah. sense to the vocal effects to mute. So that if she starts talking. He's not drowned in reverb. But when the next song starts, I need a scene that unmutes them when before the verse comes in. So um, that's why, I mean, it sounds like a lot of scenes, but I'll, they're only doing one or two things each. Right, right. And they're, yeah, they're, and they're, na- they're named that way. Yeah. They're named that way. But like theater, because the other thing that happens is you can program the desk I'm most comf- use the most is the Abbott S6L. Okay. And one of the things you can program in a scene is what what faders are on the top layer at any given point. Oh. So, I mean, if I was going to program a theater show, I would have maybe a bank off to the side, my vocal, or my uh, band VCAs or groups or whatever, sure. however you want to do that. Yep. But I would probably put like, what are the next 16 things to happen in vocal world? Like right in front of me and just, you know, I could, I could go through and mute them by uh, hand in a row, like going down the console, or I can have a program that does it. Or if something changes, the console, the vocal that I need to get to is right in front of me. When the next scene fires, it might be a different set of faders. So, uh, and I did a little of that on, on Flor- both Florence and Lincoln Park, where it wasn't necessarily the same 32 faders on the top of the desk all the time. It would be um, like, what's on this song? Like, yeah. Well, some songs, some songs. The one of the background vocalists played violin. On another song, she played acoustic guitar. On another song, she played electric guitar. So whatever instrument she was playing was always on the same fader. Oh, that's so smart! It's just yes, it's just the the what that fader was a one layer down was a different fader. It was a different yeah, it was a different input, right. but but still, right. it's that so, person's instrument right. is always channel exactly. eighteen or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. So I don't have to think about where to go for whatever the heck it is she's got in her hand. I can just go there and, and ride that if I need to, hopefully I've programmed it. So I don't have to do too much of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But still like that. And that's, 
I mean, certainly, obviously, something you can do on the Avid, you know, SXL, but you can do this on on the digital mixers that we get to use with our Weekend Warrior yeah, bands, probably. too. Yeah, I yeah. just don't know. <laughs> but no, yes, no, sure. I, I, I'm sure I know. I'm sure there are 10 consoles that do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. but they, or, like, it, that works. That, that's great. Another thing that, like, I know that multiple consoles do this as well, you might have a uh, row of faders that are your either subgroups or VCAs or what, what have you, and you, you spill them so that you see whatever, if you have a vocal, like a chorus, your chorus yep. performers on a VCA and you double tap it, it spills all their vocals out onto uh, other faders, uh, other faders. And you can do the same kind of thing there. Like you can get to it really quickly. You don't need 24 faders of vocal in front of you all the time. It's just whatever's and, and whatever's in that VCA can also change scene by scene. So it's of kind course. of whatever you need to have in front of you at any given time, you can get in front of you really quickly if you're writing the scenes to do it. Now that process that can take that can take weeks. But again, like with the multi-track record, I I I kind of go into I kind of go into rehearsals and like really all I want to do for the first week is get a good multi-track recordings of the band and time codes and then take that and program the show and I'll do it after they're gone. Right. Or come in or come in the next come in morning. early or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And like and write scenes. So I I tend to write one scene per song. And it's at the start, it probably doesn't change anything. Like it's just sure. It's just there for the sake of being there. Right. right. Yep. And then you got you get to some point where you sort of know, okay, now I need to start building at this song. Like I get I I have a basic like like the actually back up. The first step is to create what you might call a static mix where like nothing moves like the song starts the faders might move a little bit at the start of the song but basically the song is going to sound fine from top to bottom without you doing a lot of work right yeah. and then the next song starts it fires maybe the faders will move, move a little bit at that point but it gets same thing happens so you've created basically a mix of the song where the faders don't move at all it sounds fine and then you go okay now it's time to start writing some cues into this where like, okay, I need to get the guitar up in this part. Yeah. I need to get, you know, duck the background vocals out this part. Cause we, I mean, like we had one singer who stood right next to the drum kit, for example. So like I spent a lot of time with that mic, you know, mute, muting it whenever she didn't need it. Yep. So forth, so on. So uh, then I'm just on playback. Like I don't need the band to come in. Um, also super helpful in rehearsals when the band does want to come in and talk about, how something sounds um they are listening to something in their in-ear monitors that is completely different from what you would do for a mix of the band like people don't oh, of course yeah people don't ask for a mix of the band i mean really unusual in my experience they need to hear <laughs> yeah. they need to hear you know the the snare drum and the bass or something yeah like right they have very particular requirements Right. To be able to play along to it, yeah. People, it, it's oh. always fascinating when some, you know, it, some monitor mix, a recorded monitor mix from a show of a band that everybody knows, you know, makes its way out into the wild, and it's awful. And and people are like, "This is terrible," and it's like, like, yeah, I, it, like for you, but for the person doing the job in the moment. Yeah. That's, That's what, what they, they need. need. Yeah. Like you wouldn't like, want to hear my monitor mix. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't want to hear it if I was listening to the song. <laughs> yeah. So singers, singers, for example, need to pitch off of certain things. Yep. And, um, uh, which by the way, was another thing we used click the click tracks for. Yeah. It was like, if you're a cold open with a vocal, it would play the note like <sighs> before the song started. So yeah. you could pitch to it and then, and then hit the note right at the top of the song. Um, so just as an aside, Oh, that's a great uh, idea. Of course, of course you would do that. Why wouldn't yeah. you do that? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, people need to hear different things when they're to play along to like, so I was going to say vocals, vocalists need to hear something to pitch to. So they might have an instrument really loud in their mix for a amount of time. And you would never like totally inappropriate for, for, for playback for front of yeah. house mix, right? Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, for pl no, but for them it's great, but yep. for front of house, it's, no, you would never do that. Yeah. So in multi-tracking and sit, so I would set up in a separate room with the with the console, the multi-track recorder, 
program my stuff. And like every so often, the band would wander in and want to listen to something. And in every case, not that I'm that great at my job, but in every case, I would go, oh, my God, this sounds amazing. But it was because yeah. their monitor makes it, you know, <laughs> it's totally out of context, right? Yeah. So now they hear it in context. That's all. It's really the only difference. Yeah. They're just suddenly hearing, they're hearing their instrument in context. That's all. All right, folks, have you got a website that's more garage band than world tour? Fear not. Our sponsor, Banzoogle, is here to help. For two decades, Banzoogle has been turning website woes into wow moments for musicians. And now they're dialing it up with their shiny new EPK plan. Picture this, a sleek, professional electronic press kit created in minutes, not months. It's like your band's digital business card, but way cooler. Dive into fully customizable templates, preset layouts that don't suck, and music players that actually play your tunes. Add in a dash of your bio, a sprinkle of gig dates, and a dollop of press quotes. Voila! You're not just in the band, you're on the web. And if you hit a wrong note, Banzoogle's award-winning support team is like your personal tech roadie, tuning up your site seven days a week. Ready for the encore? Banzoogle's EPK plan is music to your wallet at just $6.95 a month. And because you're a Gig Gab listener, you can go to Banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days, then use the promo code GIGGABEPK, all one word, to get 10% off the first year of the new EPK plan subscription. That's Banzoogle.com, promo code GIGGABEPK, G-I-G-G-A-B-E-P-K, when you sign up for the new EPK plan, and our thanks to Banzoogle for sponsoring this episode. All right, Brad, uh, you... I mean, you just shared a bunch of tips and tricks th that you knew you were sharing. And then there were quite a few that I don't think you knew you were sharing, but I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to take at least one of them and highlight. You said, you know, in between songs, uh, you wanted to not have the vocalist, uh, their voice going through the effects, right? You know, when they, when they speak to the crowd, it, it shouldn't have mm -hmm. lots of reverb and it shouldn't be wet. It should be fairly dry mm -hmm. uh, or maybe entirely dry. But what you said was what hopefully everybody eventually learns is that you muted the sends to the effects. You didn't mute the effects. And the nice part about that is if you mute the effect, the reverb that's sort of lingering from the song gets cut right off. But if you mute the send yep. to the effect, well, then that, yep. whatever was in there gets to do its thing and the new stuff just is dry. I, I, I know this is table stakes for you, but it is one of those things. It's really important for folks to learn at some point. And if today's that day, amazing. Like, that's a yeah. good day. So I, I, I appreciate you sharing these kinds of things with us because they, yeah. they are relevant no matter, no matter the size of the room. So, yeah. For sure. For sure. It's a, it's a huge difference. And also, I'll say, if for whatever reason you miss like the song starts, and you're like, crap, I haven't got the effects on. It sounds way better to turn the sends on to the effect than it does to unmute the effect. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so it's like just a much smoother transition in both directions. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so pretty much the last, pretty much the last scene on every song was mute the vocal effects sends. That's really smart. Yeah, if you're going to do one <laughs> thing for your band... Do that so that in between songs, and you could even like trigger that with a with a foot pedal on a lot of mixers, mm -hmm. right? You know, if you're yeah. if you're trying to mix yeah. yourself from the stage or 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 mm -hmm. you know some blend of that, or if the front of house engineer mm -hmm. isn't quite as skilled as say Brad is, uh, then that you know that, but it it does make a difference. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, it's it it covers up your mistakes <laughs> for sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um. I did tell a few listeners that you were coming on the show and every one of them had like a laundry list of questions. So I, I tried to kind of pull this down into what I, I thought would be the, the most interesting for you to talk about and perhaps even helpful for the, the folks listening. Um, and if, if any of these tips come up, you know, it, 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 as an ancillary sort of added bonus, that's, that, that's what we're after here for sure. Um, but I, the the question I'll start with is what can a band do on stage to make your job easier? And and I realize that you're mostly doing big rooms and maybe what the band's doing on stage 
doesn't matter as much as it would in a small room, but I'm sure it matters at some level. So what, what can, what can bands do to make, to, to endear themselves to you, but also to make it so that you can make them sound their best? Mm. Well, I'll say this, like excessive stage volume is a problem. I don't care how big the gig is. Like it's, I, if you're playing from 50,000 people in a festival and it's just stupid loud on stage, it, it's not so much that it's hitting you or the audience. Well, that can be a problem. It's getting into all the mics on the stage. Oh, fair. Uh, so it's, uh, if I was going to say one thing, it's that be reasonably loud. That doesn't mean silent. Um, I have had, I mean, I have gone to small gigs here and there and actually ask somebody on the stage to turn their amp up a little bit because I'm standing on the floor in front of the stage in say like a two fifteen hundred seat place. Yeah. And I'm not hearing them. And I don't want to just in other words, I'd like to have equal amounts of, I don't know, let's say the bass and this guitar coming out of the PA. Sure. You know, I see so you, not, you don't like, want to have to overcompensate one. I got mm-hmm. it. Okay. And I've, I've had that problem where I had, you know, an especially loud guitar player. And uh, I've had people come up from different parts of the venue. Like, I can't hear the guitar. And it's like, I'm, I can't not hear the guitar. Yeah. Right. You know? Right. Well, guitar so, amps are very uh, directional. Yeah. Yeah. It can, it can right. be. Yeah. yeah. His was for sure. Like, so I think it's just, come, you have an acoustic instrument on the stage, the drums that, you just kind of need to go up there and go, okay, can you turn the bass and the guitar or whatever up to a level that is appropriate with the drum level that's coming off the stage. And let's just, and leave it. And then I'll take care of the rest. Yep. Uh, and um, I mean that, it, I'll almost go so far as to say it doesn't even matter what size venue you're playing. It probably matters more for a really small place. Sure, sure, sure. But I mean, it's still a problem. Like if you have a, you know, a guitar amp, I don't want to lean on the guitar players, but it's, it's okay. usually the loudest thing on the stage, right? Or the I, snare drum. I, I, it is guitar or the snare drum. That's it. It, it, well, and they both live in that frequency range that competes with the vocals too. Yeah, they, they sure can. And, um, which is another subject we can get into, but it, it, if you have the guitar blasting through the, I like using overheads. And if the guitar is just blasting through the overheads, that's a problem, you know? Yeah. Uh, so you can play at an appropriate level, which is basically let's just find a level that kind of meshes with the, what snare is doing, yep. and what the other ins- instruments coming off the stage are doing, and then you know I'll deal with that. Uh, there is such a thing as I'm sorry, I won't go that far. Not there is such a thing as too quiet, also in relative terms with the other instruments on the stage. Yeah, so, makes sense. There you yeah, go. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> yeah, do that. Well, and and one thing you said in there was get it to that level and then I'll take it from there. So is perhaps a follow up to that, you know, kind of the old Ronco thing, set it and forget it. Like are are ch- people who change levels of their instruments on stage an equal headache for you during the gig? Oh, well, for sure. Yeah. I mean, unless if it's just, whatever, if it's the last song, fine. <laughs> okay, yeah, right, fair. Yeah, sure. Okay, whatever. yep. Uh, I do think that once you establish that balance, you need to, you know, obviously want to keep it, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's really just like, before you give me the inputs, mix yourself a little bit. You know, spend a little time mixing what you're doing. And then it, it just makes my job so much easier. And then I can do things that are, I don't know, artistic, right? More, or, more nuanced, you know, yeah. Or I could pull off technical, like technical tricks that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do uh, because, you know, it, it it makes compression a lot harder when you're compressing something that something else is bleeding into that, right? Um, yep. Yeah, so just, you know, as a musician, as a, band, as a band member, focus on mixing, blending yourself in with the band. I mean, like, if you go to a jazz club, Right, there, there might not even be a PA. No, it you know? often guys, isn't. Right, yeah. Right, so those, those those players have already focused a little bit on how they work together and how they blend together. And uh, you know, if you're going in and mixing someone who's already done that, it's so much easier. Yeah, 
Yeah, you can. I remember one gig we did with uh, Bitter Pill, which is a band I I play in a lot, and uh, we're pretty. There's two of us in the band who are are also like sound engineers, so th- that helps. And everybody in the band really has a sense of of that blend thing. And we played an acoustic gig where I was just playing on a cajon, and they put two mics out, you know, maybe five feet in front of where oh, we were wow. playing. And that was it. Yeah. And it sounded yeah. freaking amazing. Now it turns out that the, the guy whose house we were at is also the chief designer for earthworks microphones. So there was a <laughs> lot of, hurt. yeah, it didn't hurt that we didn't know this until like we were halfway through the gate. It was like, what are these microphones and how do you know how to do this? We're in the middle of a field in the, you know, backwoods of New Hampshire. And he's like, Oh yeah, my day job is earthwork. It's like, Oh, he's like, I designed these nice. mics. Like, okay, well right. now, now I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but good job. High, high five to him. Buddy. Yeah. High five to him. Right. Good exactly. Job, yeah. But he knew what he could do. And because we were used to just blending as one, it makes a difference. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I did a, I did a show this summer that was, uh, symphonic it was like a, a string of dates over two weeks where different versions of a symphony would come in or they would do an opera uh and the the, the symphony would grow to as large as 75 or 80 pieces and shrink to as small as oh t- 20 or so sure uh, and we because this was sort of change every day we you know we weren't putting mics on violins we were kind of area miking as you would, yep. as you would yeah. say it. You know, so a mic across two or four violins, whatever. So um, that only works if they can balance themselves within their sections, right? If, if and we there was occasionally like, you know, oh good, a, sim, a, a snare drum next to the harp, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but, yeah. So I mean, you know, you, you that's the challenge, right? I mean, if you get it balanced, it stays balanced. In that case, all I can do is screw it up, right? So I'm just <laughs> you know, try not to. <laughs> try, yeah, try not. Try your best not to. Yeah. No, I I think that's it's a hard thing as a, a musician to you know, especially over the course of a, a several hour show, not to wind up adjusting your levels throughout. And, and I, you know, I say that as a drummer. I, you know, I generally am not playing an instrument with a volume knob, but you know, I, I hit harder and different things and I, I play with in ears. And so the level of things in my ears impacts the intensity with which I play sometimes and sometimes not in the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, I always tell monitor engineers, or if all we have is a front of house engineer, I tell them, look, you know, turn up my snare in my, in my ears. If I'm playing too loud, self-preservation will fix my problem (laughs) or fix your problem. Right. But you know, like those things can happen. And I find that at the beginning of every set, or if we're playing several hours in a row, I'll take an ear out for half a song just Mm -hmm. to hear like, okay, do we still sound like us on stage or have things gotten out of whack? And, you know, at least adjust my level to that uh, Mm -hmm. when I remember to do it. But mm. it, it's yeah. I actually do. I actually kind of do the opposite, where I'll I'll mix a few songs and put some earplugs in for a bit. Yep. And then take them back out with mm. so that I sort of have fresh ears. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a new perspective, and um, uh, I think like it's a lot easier to think of what you can't hear at any given moment. Like, oh, I need to hear the keyboards. I can't hear the keyboards. It's usually like, I can't hear something. Sure. So what happens is the monitor engineer turns the keyboards up and then you're like, oh, the keyboards are too loud. So you just turn and turn your guitar amp up, right? And so it's just, it, things just go like this, right? You yeah. know, up, up, it ratchets, up, up. it's the, yeah. <clears throat> it happens to me in front of house too. I mean, you kind of have to check yourself like, okay, well, all right, now I'm, the whole mix is hot and it's because I've just turned everything up because at any given moment. Yep. Something was I, not. I'm noticing, you notice what you can't hear. Like it's right. You're not like, oh, that's too loud. Most, most. Of, if something's too loud, something's too quiet. The first thing that pops in your head is that's too quiet. Yeah, turn it not up. turn that up. Yep. Right. So, um, it's the same with EQ. I think to me, it's like it's hard, much easier to tell what's too loud than what's missing. Yeah. You know, from a, from a uh, equalization standpoint. So, uh, I just think that's. I don't know. I mean, I'm not. 
I'm not a scientist. I, I kind of think that's just sort of how humans. That's how we, it, it, it's how yeah, yeah. most of us react to those moments. It's like, oh, just turn the keyboards up. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's so when another you're, thing to. When you're mixing uh, live, if, if it's not something that's, you know, rigidly time coded or any of that, mm-hmm. what, do you. When, when, like when you do that, when you take your earplugs, you put your earplugs in to help kind of rest your ears, take your earplugs out. Will you at that point, sometimes if you feel the situation requires it, will you start pulling certain things down to blend the mix better? Um, that does happen. Yep. Uh, it's funny. Like sometimes there's two, there's two things that are sort of perspective changers. That's one, put the earplugs in. And just listen to with the just listen to the show the earplugs. It's sometimes with the earplugs in, things will pop out at you. Of right? course, oh yeah. Like if it's just really loud, and you're like, oh, I did not realize the hi hat was totally missing, right, from the mix, right, or whatever. Yep. The name of the thing, uh, and then you pop the earplugs back out, and you're like, yeah, the hi hat's missing. So you know, then you, to me, it's just a different perspective. The other thing, and, and maybe this is just me. I find stepping away from the desk for a minute and just watching the show for 30 seconds without knobs in front of me or mm-hmm. faders in front of me is it totally changes my perspective on, on what's going on in the show. Like it's, it, it's a different process going in my mind when I'm turning knobs and watching meters that's going on in my mind when I just go off to the side and watch the show. Yeah, when, you so when you can't see those things an anymore. Member. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And yeah. it does sound different to me. I mean, it really does sound different to me. Yeah. Uh, well, it changes your, you, you, it changes the information that you have to process. And so it makes sense that it would, you would perceive it differently. Right. I mean, the sound right. is the same, I, you know, maybe you're five feet away, but what, right. like, like the sounds the same. No, but, it's like you, you can just step, step back two paces. That's like it. Just get away from, get away from the knob. Yep. Uh, I think, I mean, again, not a doctor, but I, to me, it feels like I'm just, I'm even using a different part of my brain. Like when that's happening, well, like, yeah. it's just not even the same set of processes when I'm watching instead of, as in terms of, you know, that's a good know, mixing. That's a good way to refresh, you know, in the, in the uh, mixing in smaller clubs in the old days, it would be. I, I would, I would, you know, if I was mixing a band or something in a club, I would walk around, you know, get things to a point where I felt okay walking away from the desk, right? Yeah. And, and and walk away, yeah. and then walk away and go to different corners of the room and just listen mm-hmm. and and process and then go back to the desk and if required mm-hmm. make changes. Nowadays, whenever I or pretty much anyone does that, you take the iPad with you. And you can make the changes where you are. But to your point, that doesn't change. That doesn't give you the I've stepped away perspective. It just gives you what does it sound like over there with the knobs in my hand. Yeah, right. I don't know how to put this. It's like if you step away and and look, look up at the show. Mm. Now, now you're just listening and watching like you're. You're just a listener. You're just absorbing what's happening. But when you're, I, I, I don't really do that much with the iPad, but I kind of going to guess here that if I had an iPad in my hand, I'd still be, you'd still be twiddling. That's the problem. (laughs) Yeah. You brought the desk with you in in those scenarios. Yeah. So you, you lose that perspective, uh, when you've got that screen in front of you, that's the same knob. Yeah. All right. So that, I mean, that could be super useful. Yes, uh, but I do think there's something about <laughs> about detaching yourself for a moment from the tech. Yeah, you know, just just observe and listen without having your finger on a fader. Um, I used to just, when I was mixing Rush, I would do this. I always do this with during the instrumentals. I would leave. I would just leave front of house. I take like a quick lap around the floor, kind of, and just wow. stop and watch. Uh, and then, you know, I had my system tech there in case anything yeah, blew yeah, up, well, I guess. Yeah, but, if all hell broke loose. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right. So um, it's a totally different, completely different vibe from being at the desk with your head down, watching yeah. the meter. Yeah. Totally different perspective. It makes sense. Of course it does. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you get as much as you can, you get into audience member mode, right? In those, you know, I mean. Yeah. And it's like, I don't even know. 
it's not like I'm being amazed by the lights exactly. It's just, a, like I said, I really think, it feels to me like I'm using a total, whole different part of my brain. Yeah. You know? You probably are. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. So, yeah. Good tip. There you go. I like that. Do that. Oh, that's a good tip. And and go if you bar. don't have an assistant, <laughs> yeah, right, go to the bar, yeah. If you don't have an assistant at the desk, you can take the iPad with you. Just leave it off. And that way, if there's, you know, some major emergency, yeah. you're right there. Sure. Wake it up, fix whatever it is, you know, get back to sure. make your way back to the desk. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But, right. Absolutely. Yeah, that that moment of just just listening. Because mm-hmm. that's what that's what the job is, right? Like mm-hmm. you're doing this so that the people who are there just listening can hear what they want to hear. <laughs> like, right? I mean, yeah. 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 It's just, a, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I would highly recommend stepping away from it for, it doesn't have to be long. Yeah. I mean, it, your, your perspective changes. I don't know. You go over there and like, I look at the show and 10 seconds later, I'm in a whole different mode. Yeah. So it's just useful. That's good. That's good. Yeah. 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 Um, you obviously travel a lot. Uh, it, when you're mm-hmm. on the road with a band and you're in, you know, a different city every day, you're very nomadic life can't bring a lot of stuff with you. However, we all know that we love our creature comforts because we're human beings <laughs> and that's how life yeah. is. So is there anything that you just must have with you? Uh, you know, like I, I know our friend Dave Cook, who is doing monitors for Natalie Merchant, he told me that he he has to bring his coffee rig with him, his hotel coffee right. rig. Like, is there is there anything like that 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 you bring with you just so that you know your home away from home can feel a little more like home? It, it's, it's funny. I used to, a long time ago. I did a blog for like a year. Oh, really? And one one of my blog posts was called socks and it was just about how different people pack to tour and like i know people who uh bring just like the bare minimum and then do the laundry once a week yeah uh or less even uh or people who bring like the entire legs worth of underwear you know (laughs) so so they have like enough in their suitcase for six weeks or whatever um i had i toured with a guy who just went to walmart and bought socks every huh. week or so and then would throw them away as he went that that was um, his treat to himself was always wearing guess, brand new, new socks new socks yeah, yeah. Right. all right so, i um, mean i can see so, like sure like i don't have i don't have a like thing i have to have and like things that i kind of like to have like a coffee maker or uh um i will tend to buy at the beginning of the tour not bring with me uh i toured a long time with an air popper like for popcorn <sighs> Yeah. Right. So, but I didn't like bring it. I went, you know, in rehearsals, I went down to Target or Oh, I see. Went. Like once, once yeah. you sort of got yeah. into tour mode or prep and mode, picked yeah. it up and picked it up. And I will say, I have gone, I did it. So when I toured with Lincoln Park, there's one little part of pre production where I tour managed, which is scary. But anyway, <laughs> I. <laughs> It was uh, I clearly trust uh, you, Brad. Like it's okay. It, it was just Chester and Mike. It was two people, and they were a lot of interviews, and they were just kind of playing guitar, playing keyboards, and singing uh, for as promotional for the uh, uh, new record. And I came like first day. I came with my Samsonite, all my crap in it. Yeah. And um, we flew to London. Got off the plane in London, and got to baggage claim and i realized they didn't bring anything like at all they had like their carry that's it what and they're we're, we're all standing around waiting for me <laughs> right, to get my bag. and i'm like oh this is so awkward yeah so yeah awkward. yeah was george clooney there yelling at you about bringing a pillow and that's like <laughs> all right it was like it was like i'm i'm holding up these anyway uh so from that moment on that tour i just started bringing what i could fit in a carry-on that was it wow. like so and i just sort of continue that to this day it's like you know if you if you work on it it's a week's worth of clothes maybe 10 days if you if you really if you gotta you know, stretch everything it. up and, yeah yeah do a lot of laundry in the in the, a lot of wash in the hotel sink <laughs> yeah I, and that works fine yeah it really can I, I know my i don't mind it it's a day off i just hang it up and i'm gonna go out and do something yeah, right. Uh, right. But yeah, so I mean I used to be the person that brought everything. 
and I'm really not anymore. I don't bring anything. That's amazing. So you ju- you're just a for the most part just a carry on. That's back 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 in a rolly bag. That's it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. Huh. That's fascinating yeah. to me. That's I mean it's I I can it makes perfect sense that as your career evolves and you just do this over and over again, you start to realize, mm-hmm. yeah, I, you know, I, I, I bring, I mean, we're humans. We, we bring too mm-hmm. much unless we learn not to, I think is. Well, I was forced happens. to do it. And right. I just, well, you were shamed just into it. It sounds like, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. It was so embarrassing. Like, <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Well, I don't want to keep you forever. Uh, I, there's plenty more that we could talk about, and maybe we'll have you back. Mm-hmm. We won't take four years to have you back on the show again. Uh, <laughs> <but> <laughs> Whatever you want. I apologize want. for the, for it taking so long, but uh, I'm glad that that uh, you were able to come here. It, anything else you want to share, I, either a story or a tip or or you know anything else? And if not, how how can people so, find you? Yeah, go ahead. Go. What if I tell a story and it turns out I told it last time I was on? We can fix that. We can fix that. I don't even remember. Yeah. I, I actually listened to that episode yesterday. Okay. So okay. You, we've, you've so, already so. shared a few tips that, that you shared last time, but you went deeper into them. Like the stepping okay. away from the board thing that, that was, okay. you, you mentioned casually mentioned it last time, but there's, there's plenty of things in the last episode okay. that you have not shared at all here. So you're free. Consider yourself free reign. I can edit out anything. I, right. I do. So stop, stop me if you've heard. This. I will. Um, yeah. So, uh, Getty Lee is a massive baseball fan. Um, and we often would uh, get together a handful of people from the tour and go to a baseball game. And, of course, he just always got, like, ridiculously good tickets, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, up to including the locker room. <laughs> like, oh, just, like, he, the I don't know. He special just had, tickets. Yeah. He just had connections. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it turns out he's so, Getty Lee. Yeah. Yeah, right. Who knew? He uh, – so him and Alex Lifeson and uh, – Robert Scoville, who was the engineer at the time, and me, who was kind of the fourth man of the sound crew, yeah. uh, uh, went to a ball game, and we were sitting, I don't know, five rows in the field or something, and somebody came down the stairs and came up to Alex, who was sitting on the aisle, and he tops Alex on the shoulder, and he says, hey, is that Getty Lee? <laughs> Right. Yeah. They have no yeah. idea who Alex is. Of right? course. Yeah. And Alex turns and looks over at us and then turns back to the guy and says, yeah. And I think that's Alex and sitting next to him. Right. And ne- I think that's Neil. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm not paying. I have no idea this is going Right. On. Right. Yeah. Alex is just setting this up for you. Yeah. <laughs> so like, I don't know. At some point, somebody hands me a piece of paper and a pen. I'm like, <laughs> what's this for? And, I, and Alex is like, he wants you to sign it. I'm like, what? Like, uh, okay. So I, I sign my name. And I <laughs> hand it to Robert. And Robert's like looking back and forth. He goes, he signs his name. Hands it to Getty. Getty signs his name. Sure. Hands it to Alex. And Alex takes it and hands it to the guy. <laughs> Alex didn't sign his name. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's outstanding. Oh, uh, no. Uh, like, of course, you know, Getty would be the most recognizable, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just if, I don't even know. I'm not sure if I was Neil or Alex. Honestly. Right, That's right. Yeah, well, where yeah. I fit into that. That's right. That's right. All I know is he got a he got a piece of paper back and it said Brad. <laughs> Brad, right? Yeah, Brad, Robert, and Getty. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I I have. I have never heard that story before, so you were free and clear oh, to okay. tell that. Good. I I did encounter something the other day, which was a picture of Getty and Alex sitting somewhere. And people swarming Getty and basically pushing Alex out of the way so that they could get autographs from, from, from Getty. Yeah, exactly. I guess it's a, it's a blessing and a curse for Alex. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't, yeah. Yeah. I I think it's just how it works. You know, you've got somebody that's so visually recognizable like that. So yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, he's a singer. So everybody sees him on the screen all the time. That too. That's right. Yeah, of course. Yep. Yep. I cool. have another. I have another one. Another one like that. Sure. Uh, we were in Japan with Fort Minor. It was Mike Shinoda's like side project, and his tour ma- his tour manager slash production manager was sort of a middle aged 
uh, balding guy who had sort of shaved his head, sort of come to terms with it and shaved his head. Sure. And we were walk, wandering around some park. I, I don't remember where. But this group of peop- group of kids came up and asked Mike if he would take a picture. Right? And he says, oh, sure. And they hand him his camera, and they go and put their arms around the tour manager. Oh. And I'm like, wait, what's happening right now? <laughs> and they start, and, and they're sort of, you know, there's a language barrier. Sure. And they're talking, and I pick up the word uh, words Bruce Willis in the middle of this. They think he's Bruce Willis, and they've added Mike, the singer for Lincoln Park, the camera to take the picture of this guy. <laughs> classic. That's classic. classic. That's classic. I was, just, I was just a bystander, but I could not stop laughing. That's Amazing. really funny. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, you know, people recognize what they recognize, whether it's correct or not. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. That's awesome. Thank you for doing this, Brad. Thank you for uh, for sharing your your tips and thanks for story time there. That was that was a treat too. Um, <laughs> how how would you like people to find you if or, or would you prefer they didn't? <laughs> <laughs> you can always send questions to feedback at giggabpodcast dot com. We know how to get in touch with Brad. He often responds. That's probably, yeah, that's probably good. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so there, we do have a website, Diablo Digital Inc. Diablo digital.com, excuse me, D I A B L O D I G I T A L. Yeah, I'll put that link if in the show like notes for you. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Of course. Of course. Thank you so much for hanging out. It's just been a blast. It's been good to chat with you again. It's been a while. Yeah, you too. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to yeah. see you too. Yeah, folks, this was, uh, we did the video for this too. So I'll put the video link in, uh, in the show notes at GigGab and uh, all that stuff. And always be performing, folks. We'll see you next time. <laughs>